Well, I would like to welcome you all to the 2019 installment of the Multiple Endocrine Neoplasia Workshops. And we thought tonight that we might have a little bit of fun and, uh, and tell you a little bit about the early history of multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. And we are blessed to have with us today two of the early stars in this field. And, and I'm going to introduce them. Ken Melvin was an assistant professor at Tufts New England Medical Center in Boston when he met this man in the center, Donald Jacobson. And we'll talk a little bit about what took place. But the important thing is that it was this chance interaction, which you, I think, as you hear the story, will consider remarkable, that led to the development of the use of calcitonin for screening, for prospective screening, and set the, set the table, so to speak, for the rapid integration of genetic testing into the management of MEN2. And I'm going to let them tell you in their own words. Now, Ken is now 85, looks about 65, <laughs> still pilots his own plane. Uh, Don is 80. And of course, to, their, uh, to your right is Eric Jacobson. And Eric is a member of the next generation. In fact, he is the son of the very first person to have a thyroidectomy based on calcitonin test. We'll talk about it. So let's, without ado, let's move forward and we're going to try to keep this moving because what I really want is for you to hear from them. Uh, but I want to, want to also tell you the story. So I've already introduced them and we'll... Thank you. Actually, you can walk over there and turn up the volume a little bit. <laughs> I can't get close to it because it will screech. Yes. It, uh, there are two, the two left buttons control, and I'm not sure which controls which. There. Okay, is that better? Better and better. Everybody hear me? <coughs> okay, no. wonderful. So this slide depicts the history of medullary carcinoma, and we're going to focus today on this section. So keep in mind, medullary carcinoma was first separated from other types of thyroid cancer in 1959. In 61, Sippel described the first series of individuals with MEN2. And then there was a mad scramble with people all over the globe working on MEN2 thereafter to try to understand it and to, to piece together the components of the multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2 syndrome. And then subsequent to that, or occurs the mapping of the MEN2 gene, the identification of the red gene, and then the subsequent development of kinase inhibitors and other therapies. Now, I, I want to point out that none of this happened in isolation. What we're going to talk about tonight occurred in a mad scramble of people across the globe who were fiercely competing with each other. And there were major groups in London, in Sweden, uh, on the, the main continent, in Germany and France, and there were multiple centers in the United States, including our own uh, center, that were working on this problem. But something unique happened in Boston. Uh, it was the chance meeting of Don Jacobson and Ken Melvin, who was a New Zealander trained in London and who had been exposed to and worked with Nolan Williams and was very familiar with multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2, even though his direct involvement in the management of these kindreds was not great up until the point that he met Don Jacobson. And there was another um, story that was going on, and that is uh, Raj Yalo developed the immunoassay for which she won the Nobel Prize along uh, and with her colleague Sullivan Bursas. And in the mid 60s, Roz organized a meeting in which a number of influential people, John Potts, Armin Paschen, Seymour Reichlin, and others, uh, a small group of fewer than 20, 
attended to learn how to develop an immunoassay. We take it for granted now, but it was hot stuff then. And uh, Ken Dalton and Armin Paschen started to talk about developing assays for calcitonin as uh, Dylan Williams had put together the thought process that the parafollicular cell caused medullary thyroid carcinoma and it produced calcitonin. So, moving on here. Ken, tell us about the early measurement of calcitonin. Well, as you say, I arrived in Boston. I was brought in by immigration as an unskilled laborer <laughs> <laughs> in order to avoid the strictures of the Treaty with New Zealand about brain drain. So, but in any event, uh, I had been uh, tuned in to do what Williams was to say. And he happened to comment that <coughs> the uh, medullary carcinoma resembled in many ways, uh, histologically, a parafollicular cell. And that maybe medullary carcinoma uh, was a tumor of parafollicular C cell. And if that were the case, <clears throat> well, perhaps it, the tumor might produce calcitonin. Well, that didn't mean much to me at this point. We were giving salmon calcitonin to humans with no effect. Uh, and so that was not very exciting, and I sort of put it in the back burner. I arrived in Boston, and I was having spending lunch hour in my office quietly, no one else around. And <clears throat> by the way, these guys I haven't seen in 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> this, fella, this fella pokes his head round the tape round the door and says, say doc, will you feel the neck? Uh, he says, I've had so many of my family uh, die from lumps and cancers of the neck. So I was pretty taken aback at this, but I soon jumped up and felt his neck, and then when I heard his history, I thought, my God, here's an opportunity. And, and so he proved to be a real gopher, a do-it man, and he went uh, and organized a, a family meeting, hired a hall, and there were 97 members of his family there. And so I got up and made a speech and suggested that um, if they would sign the disclaimer form that I'd had printed in advance, which they all did, we could perhaps study them. And that while we had no promise that anything would benefit them, we hoped that it certainly would. So he went to the ground and he turned up all of these folks and he remained the organizer amidst that family from that point on. So the question, how did you measure calcitonin? <laughs> <laughs> I was called to the ICU where there was a gentleman unconscious with the most aggressive fear I've ever seen in a whole lifetime. And his blood pressure ranged from zero to off unmeasurably high. He was unconscious and I noticed he had a trilectomy scar and he had a massive liver. Now when we got him under control and he could speak, it evolved that his mother had had the same <coughs> it, The light went on. And so I uh, managed to get him to provide me with all of his urine. And then I went to John Potts at Mass General and suggested that we look for calcitonin in his urine. He dismissed it. No, not worth doing. Uh, I went to Alan Tash and he was an enthusiastic. He said, bring me the urine. And he was, he was doing a rat fire assay at the time, but he was very close to a radio immunoassay of the serum. So I got this urine, and two weeks later, I can still hear the excitement in his voice. He said, it is full of calcitonin. Uh, and from that point there on, we had the immunoassay and the tools of trade ready, the stage was set to investigate these folks as they came online. Uh, I might just add that a major drug company heard about this discovery of this poor gentleman with his liver full of metastatic cancer and a urine packed with the peptide calcitonin 
they promised him a lifetime of unlimited supply of beer if they if he would provide them with all of his urine <coughs> and they provided this top loading freezer in his bedroom and collected his urine they from that urine synthesized human calcitonin for clinical use so that brings us to the next part of the story. And this is a photograph of Don Jacobson taken about uh, 10 years ago with his wife, uh, Susan. And, and so uh, Don was the, the real instigator. Whoops. Thing just happened here. So none of this would have happened had it not been for Don's persistence. And, Don, why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened in your family that made you seek out help? Okay, okay. Uh, actually, I got started because of a number of my uncles, my father's brothers, and sisters, were male and female, uh, had obvious neck problems. For instance, I had one uncle that, that uh, was in the Navy and he got discharged in 1945 and they did a thyroidectomy or a partial. And what happened was they left the wound open. So this gentleman could never take a shower. He could never uh, go fishing. He lived right on the water, lost an arm. And what I did do is, again, asked me, we did this, I had Joe, I had this Joe in the family, J-O-E-L. So Ken asked me, uh, you know, why is Joe's neck wound still open. What's the, what happened? Well, we really didn't know what happened. At the time, all we knew was the post-physical that he had taken to get out of the Navy. They found this lump in his thyroid, but they left it open. So, Melvin, Dr. Melvin suggested that we close the wound. Why is the wound left open? Well, we don't know the background of that because he was a, a post physical from the Navy getting out of the Navy. So, Dr. Melvin arranged to have the wound closed. And what happened is, was that Joe was very happy he could take a shower and he could go fishing, he could go swimming. So that he was very grateful that that happened. Also, right about the same time, was my father at my father's wake, uh, and he had met Joe. <coughs> I, I found out that I had a cousin who had her thyroid removed, and she lived in this little Rhode Island, not too far from So then my sister, I, I've got, there's five siblings in my family. The only ones that don't have this one is myself. And the youngest sister, who just never developed in this group. My older brother, which happens to be uh, his father, Eric's father, did volunteer to go. 
go and have a cup of coffee with him. I'm sure he wishes well, but that's all that matters. It normally takes for that operation at that time, it would take probably five minutes for the results to come in. And he was thoughtful. to about that point that everybody now started when Eric's father, my brother, my older brother, we found him with the MTC. That it, it made all my sisters come in and get checked. And two of them did have a positive <laughs> So this is Ken, this is a B-51 Mustang, and I learned when I visited Ken several years ago that he flew B-51 Mustangs for the New Zealand Air Force before coming to London and then to the United States. And this is a, uh, a, a P-51 that he built from a kit, if I understand correctly. But, but there, there was uh, an interaction. So, Don, you've already told us your family history that you got tired of going to wakes for that's people right. who died of thyroid cancer. And that's what led you to, <coughs> to meet with uh, Ken. So tell me, and I want to hear from both of you, what happened in your first meeting? Okay. Um, my, first, my first meeting, not with Ken, but I had a, a, a company doctor. I was a lineman as, uh, as I was coming up and climbing poles. And every year they would give us a physical on our own company doctor, a power company doctor. So I told them about all these problems I had with uncles that I possibly had was on their necks and various things like that. So they made an appointment with a Dr. Cassidy from Tufts Military Medical Center. Went in to see Dr. Cassidy and Tufts from my house is roughly about 20 miles. I went in to see Dr. Cassidy 
and he wasn't dead. So I was, I was persistent. I said to the reception, she said, you're going to have to make an appointment. I said, wait a minute. I said, I have something less wrong with me. I want to see his replacement. <laughs> so she said to me, well, okay, why don't you step in that room right there, and I'll send somebody in. Go in the hole. She sent in Dr. Mel. And that's how we get started. <laughs> well, given that history, it didn't take long to gather up pathology specimens from around Boston. And there were many of them. Most of them were at the Mass General, actually. Right? Right. And of course, because medullary carcinoma had not been recognized for long, none of them were labeled as such. But my pathologist <coughs> certainly corrected that. And so we knew we were onto a very fertile field. And uh, as Don has described, he gathered the family together, signed them all up for study. And the thought was, well, OK, if uh, these are C cell tumors, they ought to respond to induced hypercalcemia. So we gave them a variety of secretagogues, the four hour standard calcium infusion of 15 milligrams. A kilogram was what was ultimately selected. Glucagon was tried because a number of investigators had diffused animal thyroids with glucagon. Why the hell they tried it, I don't know. But it, it produced severe hypocalcemia, the diffuser did. And the other one was uh, pentagastrin, which was Gestapo tactic, really, when it came down to it, because it was not well tolerated. So we switched to the calcium infusion, uh, which produced extraordinarily clear distinction between normals. And we had the infusion test for plasma calcitonin assays immunologically by uh, Professor Tashin uh, in a, a 155 normals and with uh, some 44 patients with medullary carcinoma. And we'll show you the slide. It shows a, a, an incredibly clear distinction that this test was capable of distinguishing carcinoma patients from normals. So then we came to the point, who shall be first? Uh, it came down to Don because he was a go-getter getting the family together and saying, okay, guys, this test may help. If we don't know for sure, we need a volunteer. So Eric's father stepped up, and he volunteered. Well, while Don was going to, to, to ground and, and convincing the family, my job was to convince the surgeon that he should open the neck of a perfectly young, fit, clinically normal male adult <laughs> on the basis of an experimental, non-validated blood test. Well, Harry Miller. Now he's a good old he was a good old boy, a Central Oregon rancher, of course. <laughs> and so he nothing was too much trouble. So <laughs> Harry rolled up his sleeves and we made a career for him with, with his family and with others, doing the thyroidectomies and others. And <laughs> Eric's father was the first one to go. There were, I think, five or six members of the family in the waiting room outside the OR. And the tension was palpable. Uh, I was in the OR looking over Harry's shoulder, and it looked like a perfectly normal thyroid. And Harry could slip his fingers in, and he palpated it, and he could feel a nodule in each lobe of the thyroid. Right, out it comes. He took this thyroid out and he bivalved it right there. And you see the slide. Let me, I'm going to jump ahead here. <laughs> uh, a number of slides uh, to get to that. And unfortunately, I'll have to go back uh, a bit. Uh, there it is. Yes, so this is the propositus, Don, with the arrow. <coughs> and Robert, who is Eric's father, was the first person to ever have a thyroidectomy based on a calcitonin measurement. And it's important to emphasize 
that by the standards of the day, there were no thyroid scan abnormalities, there were no palpable abnormalities. It took a brave surgeon to accept a hormonal measurement and to, to remove the thyroid gland. And Robert uh, is now 85 years old. Uh, this uh, is Don's son, who turned up with a false, what we now know <laughs> is a false positive. He is the very first false positive test. Calcitonin. And Richard Hertigan is the uh, other person who also had medullary carcinoma. Robert is now 85 years old and still working. So he unequivocally derived benefit from the surgical procedure. And this was his uh, thyroid gland. You can see the focus of medullary carcinoma in the left upper lobe and a larger focus on the right upper lobe. So this was the, the very first. Now I'm gonna go back because we're missing some history here. I wanna tell you a little bit about the kindred. Um, let, me, let me just say, uh, these were the two New England Journal articles, uh, one uh, using a bioassay, the rat bioassay for measurement of calcitonin, which I believe was the first actual measurement of calcitonin in a patient with medullary thyroid carcinoma. The second is the development of the immunoassay and uh, studies in patients with established medullary thyroid carcinoma. I have to point out that Stratton Hill, uh, who contributed to this study, was a faculty member here. So MD Anderson had a little bit of a part of this. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, let's go back to the family. This is Anne Augustuson. She was the gene carrier, and she uh, came from Sweden, uh, as did her husband Lars. But uh, Anna came from mainland Sweden. Lars came from a small island in the Baltic Sea, uh, Gotland. And they didn't meet in Sweden, as far as I know. They met in Boston, where they married and had uh, eight children. And we'll come to that in a second. Now, what was interesting is that Lars, as I learned this afternoon, was a sh work, had a unique talent that was required to build ships. And there was a big shipbuilding industry in Boston at the time, up through both World War Wars, and his services were needed when ships were needed. But he tra traveled back and forth between Sweden, and at one point, once he married, Anna went with him. Now, I learned today that Anna also worked on ships and uh, worked as a... In the laundry. In the laundry, on, on the ship uh, coming over, and that paid her way to and fro. And so they went back and forth several times, eventually uh, settling on the south shore of Boston. And there's, that's another remarkable thing is that Ken would not have been able to do the studies on your family except for the fact that the family was concentrated in a very small geographic area, as Don pointed out, less than 20 miles from the New England Medical Center where these studies were done. Now, Anna was a part of a very large Swedish kindred, and this was put together many years ago, actually for one of these workshops by Margarita Helenius Baird, at showing uh, Anna's position in this very large kindred. Now, my understanding, Ken, is that she was lost, that uh, when they put the family tree in Sweden together, they said she's somewhere, we don't know where and uh, Ken found her, uh, found her through Don, actually. Uh, I think by then she was deceased, perhaps? Uh, right shortly after that. Right shortly after that. So again, not, there, there were a remarkable number of coincidences that came together to make these studies uh, possible. Another thing, this slide shows Anna and Lars on the top, and then eight children. The purple designates gene carriers. So this was also a noisy family. 
And it wasn't surprising that Don was going to lots of wakes. Uh, and, and the thyroid cancer in his generation and the generation before was a significant issue. Would this have happened if only one member of your family had been affected? I think not. So a, again, another uh, coincidence. These are uh, photos, this I believe was taken in Sweden where the first three children were born, I think, if I recall correctly, and then the other five children were born in the United States and because the family moved back and forth several times. And uh, again, just to make the point that this is Weymouth where Don uh, now lives. Weymouth is down here. The shipyard was right here. And of course, Boston is about 20 miles away. So another, the likelihood that this the family would sit outside an area of major academic interest is another uh, coincidence. So um, let's just talk a little bit about how did your family receive this information, Doc? And how did you go about getting them to participate in this, what became a 20-year clinical trial? Well, when we started getting results in, of the MDC gene in the family, uh, Dr. Melvin was involved at that time. He asked me, how many relatives do you have in this area? So uh, at that time, I, I figured it was 30 or 40. But I hired a hall, a local hall in the town of Lincoln, and Dr. Melvin came in and spoke. <laughs> and spoke about the gene, the carriers, and all the people that are involved. At that time, we were looking for a volunteer. Dr. Melvin was too. And Eric's father, my brother, <coughs> volunteered. between Dr. Melvin, Don Jacobson, and the members of the family that kept them interested and involved for 20 years. And, and it really was a landmark study. This was a family tree from about 1975, and uh, the family is now about 300 people. So it's quite large. So Ken, this is a slide, and I apologize, I forgot to put in the slide you wanted, but this will have to do. Uh, so this was the calcitonin values in the Jake Henry. So tell us about them. Well, we, we managed to get uh, calcium infusion tests performed in uh, some 140 normal controls, and in uh, 64, uh, patients with medullary carcinoma, uh, the separation from normal was very clear. Look at the uh, rhombus next scale. 
and there's shown there the test results in six of uh, the Jacobson family, and all of those were positive for medullary carcinoma. And it was based upon those initial studies that we were able to go to the family and propose surgical removal of their thyroids. And as it proved, we had no false positives. That every one that we operated, in fact, had a medullary carcinoma bilateral. Tumor always being at the junction of the upper and middle third of the thyroid and associated with C cell hyperplasia in remote areas of the thyroid throughout. So moving uh, along, um, we've already been over this, so I'm going to move uh, along. And we've already been through the next slide. Um, tell us, Don, about the family meeting that you had. There were 12 individuals in your family who had abnormal calcitonin test results. How did you, as a family, process this information, and how did you decide who was going to go first? Well, the family is probably had as a family, after this got started, reunions. And we would invite all the relatives that we know that were removed, that had the medullary, actually all of them, whether they had it or not. And we all discussed was a remote problem there that was very radical to our thinking. And uh, Eric used to run the meetings, and uh, that's how we started. Good. And as I recall, your, your father, Eric, you weren't there, of course, <laughs> but your father, uh, after the family had somewhat of an impasse, Robert, Eric's father, just said, I'll go first. And once he broke the ice and was found to have medullary carcinoma, everyone lined up, and as I recall, they all wanted to go next. <laughs> so so uh, another remarkable story. So I'm gonna move forward. We've been through some of, of this. Um, and and uh, focus. So, there were two papers that came from this, both published in the in New England Journal. The first was the identification of C cell hyperplasia as a precursor for medullary thyroid carcinoma. And the, the second was, of course, the description of the J. Kindred uh, uh, calcitonin measurements and the subsequent thyroidectomy showing that 12 out of 12 patients who had abnormal calcitonin levels had uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma. So a remarkable uh, story. And I'm sorry for that. Oh, that's all right. Maybe I'll stand in front of you. So that's good. And wide enough to, uh, so, so the next question is, and this is where I became involved in this family, is, is it possible to detect medullary thyroid carcinoma in children at risk and remove their thyroid glands and prevent death from medullary thyroid carcinoma and pheochromocytoma. And we're gonna to turn to Eric over the next few slides and have him talk. And so you were a young boy when screening for medullary thyroid carcinoma began. Can you describe the screening process and how did it impact you? Yeah, um, you've gotta have a mindset that you're 10 years old or 11 years old <laughs> and mom and dad, dad say, you've gotta do this wasn't strong enough to pipe back, so we just did it. But nonetheless, we, we did it, we went in there. It was a, at first, it was a, a five-day test, and it was it came the rear end. Uh, it eventually migrated to a two-day test, and, but uh, the, the, the biggest thing was, uh, it was over April vacation, so we had to, you know, instead of taking time off from school, we had to go to the hospital. Um, but there was a lot of tests involved. Uh, the most the lengthy one was, was a four-hour calcitonin test. 
restricted with calcium and took blood cells every 30 minutes and then you had to go to the bathroom every 30 minutes and press the back off the box. And then throughout the week while you were there, they did a bone density, they did a, uh, a, a, a x-rays, a uh, skin testing. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the skin, uh, they took the stamina. Yeah, 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 okay. And uh, eye testing, and uh, we had the uh, iodine injections. And then last but probably one of the most important things was the social worker always there in coming. And we had to speak to him and uh, obviously invent the, the what we're going through. Um, but one of the things I wanted to mention was the pentagastrin test. It, it, it initially, the, thyroid, the uh, calcium test was four hours. And then eventually, as technology got better and medicines got better, they, they introduced pentagastrin tests, and, uh, which wasn't fun. Bit about that, but um, that certainly helped out. But there was a lot of testing over five days, and, and again, you know, the, the young kids, you know, it's not just my family with Don's kids and all my other siblings and my cousins, you know, same age range. It, it wasn't all just testing, <laughs> a lot of it was research looking for yeah. evidence of clinical effects of hypercalcinemia in the human, all of which were subject to subsequent publication. So, Eric, yeah, you had your thyroid taken out as a 15-year-old, as I recall. 1975. And uh, so, what? when your parents suggested that you have a thyroidectomy, how did you think about this? Well, first of all, you know, how did you, what discussions did you have with your brothers and sisters who also had thyroidectomies and your cousin? There was no discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you're, you're 15 years old. You know, for me personally, you have to be in high school, playing a lot of sports. Oh, by the way, you got to take six months off. You got to get operated on. You can't do anything. Blah blah. Uh, it was tough. It was, hey, am I going to die? I mean, nothing was going on back then. We thought the needles were this wide and everything <laughs> hurt. It, it wasn't fun. It really was. Uh, compared to today, but anyways. So back then it was uh, lengthy uh, uh, when they told me. I really don't remember the conversation other than the fact that, yeah, you gotta do it, so suck it up kind of thing. And uh, yeah, it was uh, the biggest issue with me was going back to high school and not being able to play sports, but uh, carrying this bandage around my neck and, and this huge scar. And people were like, what the fuck? Where, you know, where is that from? Was your head crooked kind of thing? You know, but, uh, a lot of psychological things going on. So it, it was tough, but uh, I remember asking my father, am I gonna die? And, and uh, he says, no, but as long as we address this, and uh, that, uh, it's just gonna help us all in the long run. Obviously we're here today and we did. Okay, this uh, slide shows the two New England Journal articles, again, describing prospective screening. And, and I don't wanna suggest that these were probably the first and most um, scientifically well done studies, but there were many other people who were working in this space at that time. And I don't want to in any way suggest that this wasn't a communal effort. But uh, again, uh, two remarkable uh, publications that came out of this uh, thing. So Eric, now that you're down the road and we're going to share with people in a few minutes the uh, long-term outcome which is pretty good, as you've seen. How did your generation think about all of this? Well, way back when, we, we were very scared. We were frightened as to what's gonna happen. And, you know, should we get this done, should we not get it done? We really didn't have a choice, but our parents told us to get it done. But looking back, it was great. Uh, we, we went from a five-day testing to three days, two days, to you know, today, which is, I don't wanna say a five-day blood test, but it's pretty quick. Technology has been great. Uh, my siblings are all accepted. Uh, you know, some of them have different uh, issues than myself with the adrenals. Your friends for me. Do you have children? I don't. You don't. So this did not. You, you and your wife did not. Yeah, have this to, is this is a strange one for me. There's five of us in my immediate family. Uh, uh, my older sisters and four boys. The three that are carriers of MPC do not have any kids. The other two do. So was it psychological? I don't know. <laughs> well, could I just add something to expand on what he just said? I was young and inexperienced, and I made a dreadful mistake. And at a meeting of the family, 
I was asked, well, why don't you suggest we do as a family now that we know that these, this testing can relieve us of a long-term problem and we can get cured? And I said, well, and he didn't say this to young women, uh, that she shouldn't have children. I asked that thought. Well, we, I blame that on somebody else. That was an outrage. And yeah. They, and, and they said, Jesus. well, if you've got this test and it's really pretty good, we're going to go and have children. And furthermore, we look at our grandfathers and they live a good long life. So thank you for that advice, but no way. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, you know, some of the numbers will show that uh, my family members were dying in the mid, mid to late 50s. So now they're in their 80s. And uh, as a result of all these tests. Questions today at lunch, which I threw it over again. John and I said, Yeah, sure, why not? Not that we knew everything we now, but we know that it's going to help you or the, somebody else in the future. So, so I'm going to jump ahead. We're getting uh, close to the end uh, here. Uh, the other point that I would make is that the J. Kindred what, uh, samples were provided to Bruce Ponder, and you guys were a part of the mapping effort that led to the identification of RET as, as a gene. And I don't know that that was ever acknowledged, but you played an important role. So congratulations on that. So the final question is, did thyroidectomy cure children who went early thyroidectomy? And I think this group already knows the answer to that, but uh, this is the 50th year since Kim started this study. So about three years ago, uh, Libby Grubbs, where's Libby here? Um, over there. Libby and her team uh, went, we, we went to Weymouth, actually, probably not Weymouth, a little further out. Plymouth. And, and uh, everyone in that first cohort of children prior to 1993 when the RET gene was discovered, uh, except for three, as I recall, agreed to come and have an ultrasound and to have calcitonin testing and a serum calcium measurement. And of course, this is Denise Smith uh, to the left, uh, Eric and Don Jacobson, uh, who were instrumental in organizing this. And this is the team that went, uh, one of our crack ultrasonographers, uh, uh, came from Houston to Boston, arranged to have a machine delivered to Plymouth, and did ultrasounds on all of the uh, children. Whoops. And, and the other um, are members of Libby's team at that time. And what we found was that of the 18 uh, now adults, uh, Eric, you're now 59, uh, th that uh, only three of them had measurable calcitonin levels. Uh, and they were low level elevations. One was, the two were in the range of 20 micrograms per ml. One was uh, about 55 micrograms per ml. And the rest were undetectable. And so we believe this has stood the test of time. Uh, we did a high resolution ultrasound of the neck on all of these patients and uh, none of them had abnormalities. And these are the, the sequential calcitonin values in the individuals who had measurable calcitonin levels. And as you can see, two of them have had stable values for more than a decade. The third on the right has an elevated value and, and is due to have that repeated. We don't know where that's going. Um, and so the, the question is, has this intervention been successful? And our definition of successful would be that these individuals live a normal life. And uh, so far, we can say that 83% or 15 of the 18 evaluable patients have no detectable calcitonin in the median of 40 years after thyroidectomy and are presumed cured. Three patients operated upon at 9, 15, and 15 years have low level calcitonin values, but no identifiable disease by ultrasound. Um, and, and so we're optimistic that these people are going to live a normal life. 
These are the survival curves, and you will note the first generation, the eight children, uh, you can see that their survival curve. The second group are the first 12 that Ken and, and uh, 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 Dr. Miller operated upon back in the late, uh, in the early 70s, and their survival curve. And then in green is the survival for all of those children who had uh, prophylactic thyroidectomy based on conversion from a normal calcitonin test to a positive uh, test. And none of them have died. Uh, believe it or not, this is not yet statistically significant. So we can't say that, that, the, that we have actually helped these people, even though it's been uh, an average of about 42 years but we are one year away from it being statistically <laughs> significant. And, and I'm pretty sure we're going to get it. So uh, that's, any final thoughts from Don, uh, Ken, or, or Eric? And we'd like to open it up for questions. This is your chance to, to ask the very, the pioneers, I guess is the way I would describe it. Well, one a thought that I had, uh, First of all, thank you very much for helping us out and Dr. Nolan for that time. Um, as a result of this, we, we actually have uh, frequent family reunions. And, and we had one back in 2000 with over 250 people uh, coming from the far ways in uh, Minnesota and, and uh, the state of Washington. And we're going to try and have it every 10 years so we get another one up. But um, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's, yeah, we have this connection here, but it's, it's, it just feels good to get together. And also, I'm a web designer by trade, so I've actually built a website, so if you need to see all this information, including pictures, go to jacobsonjourney.com or medullarythyroidcarcinoma.com. Very cool. I'm jealous. <laughs> you got the URL. <laughs> <laughs> he says he'll sell it to me for a few thousand dollars. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, been, it's been fun. I mean, it's, what are you going to do? It's just one of those things in life, and you know, try to take the high road. And Ken and Don, any thoughts? Any final thoughts? Well, I think it's just extraordinary how circumstantial quite unrelated events came together and produced uh, an evolution of knowledge that then led into a set the stage for your finding with the genetics, which we now rely on. The only thought I have is, I think I'll tell him that story about Joel. <laughs> I told you, it was mentioned earlier that we had one uncle, his name was Joel, and he was 45 years old and he got discharged from the Navy. And when he got discharged, this is the end of the stage, he had detected a lump on his thyroid. So all they did getting out of the Navy was pull a capture. And as I said before, he could never take a shower. He could never go fishing. He could live right on the water. So Dr. Melvin asked him one day, he says, uh, you know, tell me something. Why What's the story with Joel? Why has he got that open wound in his neck? So I says, no, I don't know. I says, uh, at least in, in Dr. Mullen says, well, look, I'll make arrangements that will close that up. It shouldn't be open. So I don't know who did the actual operation. It probably was uh, Henry, Harry Miller. So anyways, Joel was so happy that this was closed, and that he could live a normal life, so to speak. He was very grateful for any tests that were coming along the way that was being funded by the American Cancer Society. They used to do that for those days. So they asked, uh, they asked Joel if he would undergo 
a bone mineral test. And I don't know if anybody else had that test. So Joel called me one night and he says, uh, he used to call me Donnie, Donnie, I'll undergo that test. And he says, I'm very thankful for what happened to my neck. And, you know, he took care of that. I had the doctor take care of that. He says, under one condition, you don't come to me. Well, if you do it once, you get very feisty. <laughs> and very protective of the camera. So anyways, two o'clock in the morning, I'm in bed, the phone rings. Who is it? Aunt Mary. Hey, what the hell are you doing with Joe? <laughs> I, I couldn't answer it. Because Joel told me, don't tell him. <laughs> I just thought it did my dad something. <laughs> Any uh, questions? Yes, Camille. Um, just to ask, uh, in the 60s and 70s, the family had neochromocytomas, right? Some members. How, how did you do the screening? How did you, did you find out that one of you had a neochromocytoma? Well, Well, at the time, there was a number of things going on. One was my father's murder. Okay. At the wake, I had two sisters that had problems. I had a, a, a cousin that lived in Rhode Island and just had her thyroid removed. And there was three uncles that were living that had problems as well. So that's how we really got started. So after the we, wake, they met at my house, at my parents' house, and they talked about what the heck's going on here. So they said, you, you kick the ball and you go to your doctors and let someone else die. So we were swimming together. During the course of those days in hospital, yes, they did. And in those days, it was possible to keep people <laughs> Money was everything. <laughs> but no, we did uh, every uh, 24 hour had a colony made in that room. Uh, and yeah. careful clinical history. So I can uh, relate uh, during my fellowship, I missed the Endocrine Society one year because I had chosen to do a, an angiogram for uh, Peter. Jacobson, who had a pheochromocytoma. He infarcted his pheo. I did not go to the Endocrine Society. <laughs> I sat home nursing him with alpha and beta adrenergic blockers, uh, phenoxybenzamine and propranolol were all that we had at that time. So to, to answer your question, the diagnosis was made by arteriography. Is that the, the answer you're looking for? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, I don't know, I, well, arteriography was available at, yeah, at I, your I time as too, well. I was too conservative to do arteriography on a pheo. Yeah. <laughs> With levetalol now, that, that would have been less. Well, we did block them before the procedure, <laughs> but, and, and, and it all went well except for this one it's particular It's really patient. stretching your luck <laughs> to challenge a pheo. Yeah, well, we, we got away with it, except for this, well, we got away with it. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's leave it at that. Any other questions? Yes, Peter. How many uh, of your family died from pheochromocytoma? Did they all die from medullary part carcinoma when they died, or do they have hypertension? And uh, the East Theo, during my experience with yes. the family, were fairly laid back and benign. And it took a, a quite a lot to diagnose them. Mm -hmm. they, they really weren't evident clinically, most of them. They have yeah. hypertension or? I'm sorry? They have hypertension? I, I can't recall. 
And that, yeah. they, we did not see hypertension. In fact, we, we hypothesized that it was because they were epinephrine, they had a disproportionate amount of epinephrine production. I don't know that that has ever been proven scientifically, but that's what, what makes an MEN2 CO different from uh, a VHL or, or other uh, pheochromocytomas is that the ratio of epinephrine to norepinephrine is higher. And we always hypothesized that their symptoms, which were headache, attacks of shakiness, palpitations, but not hypertension until the tumors became quite large. And then we would see hypertension, but we never let them get that far, quite frankly. I, I, at that stage, from the relatively brief experience I had with them, uh, see, there seemed to be emerging a relationship between methylated corneal nerve and fear. And I don't know where that stands anymore. It's still there. <laughs> and it's, it's an observation, but, but I, I think it's largely with RET positive tumors. I don't know that that's true for VHL or other paraganglionomas. No, you, only RET. Only with RET. So it's a, it, the medulated corneal nerves has, there are some other genes that it's been associated with, but of the ones that cause FIO, it's only RET. Okay. Yeah, because we examined all of them with the slip length, and it was fascinating to see those changes. Good. Other questions? All right. I would, like, I would like to thank you, Bob, for <laughs> organizing this session. today, both Eric and Don had scallops. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. There's plenty to drink, I believe. And, uh, how, how late are the doors open, Libby? Or Allison? Allison, how late are, how, how long are we allowed to party here? <laughs> As long as we want. Stay as long as you want. As long as there's wine and food. Please stay.